Hello, welcome to Footprint. My name is Samuel Atamensa. We started a conversation with Mr. Kojo Yanka. For those of you who watched a um, beautiful conversation, humble upbringing and um, taking his steps cautiously in a progressive manner. And then in the a, in a last episode, we actually got to where he entered the University of Ghana. So um, this is where we are going to take off from. If you lost out on the other episodes, you can catch us on YouTube. Just look for CityTube and type Mr. Kojoyanka. You'll find it. Beautiful story. Good, good day again. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, so in our last uh, conversation, we talked about how you ended up in the University of Ghana, even though you had options to go to other places. Uh, what was it like in 69 when you entered University of Ghana? First of all, let me say there was a new mood mm. in the country as okay. a whole. Uh, we had gone through the military coup in 1966, Six, yeah. and then we had had a handover in 1969. So uh, we were to start a civilian kind of um, regime. It affected the mood on campus. It also created a new sense of um, liberation, mm -hmm. quote and unquote, because student movements began again. Uh, people were more free. I became editor of, a, of Commonwealth Hall Journal. Oh, as an FU. As a first year student? No, in oh, my second year. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I became a member of the editorial board very mm -hmm. early because I showed interest in. So you're, you're, you're a vandal? I'm a vandal. Well, I, I was going to say you don't look it, but I'm afraid yeah. what they can do to me. So <laughs> please, I didn't say it to you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a vandal. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what, what a vandal should look like. But uh -huh. I, I joined the editorial uh, board. I wanted to look at the way they sound at times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joined a number of societies um, again. I said earlier that when I entered university, I joined Legon 7. Legon 7 was a, 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 a drama group um, founded by Dr. Mohammed Ben Abdullah, who at that time was lecturer at the Institute of African Studies. Oh, but wow. Legon 7 was a drama group. You could, I would say it was the beginning of the formation okay. of uh, the National Theatre Company. Okay. Because okay. we were doing plays for television, uh, for secondary schools, those the term you could use, mm -hmm. uh, the television to teach. So we were, we took part and uh, so I, I started very early, but at the same time, I was doing a lot of literary writing wow. and was active. I, so I, when you got, got into first year, I, I want to believe that your year mates had gone ahead. Yes, they had gone the ahead two years. Yeah, and so most of them were in their final years. When back their in their final the day. year. Uh, yes. So you are not, you are not, you didn't feel an alien, you are like nah, already. Not at all. You know. I was, I was already in the, yeah, in the fray. I, and as I told you earlier, I had, I had built a certain level of self confidence that, I didn't feel I had even lost anything. Yeah, yeah. I moved in, did what I wanted to do. Um, started winning you know, academic prizes. Mm. Professor Kwapon was the was the vice, vice chancellor. chancellor at the time, yeah. Yeah, and creative writing. I won one at the end of the first year, I won another one at the end of the second year, you know like the Bitsen Nicole Prize mm -hmm. for creative writing. But what course Langston what Hughes. Course I was reading do? English, I chose English French, sorry. English French and linguistics. Okay, okay. Then I dropped. Which one did I drop? 
Um, but you ended up with English, of course. I ended up with English, but mm -hmm. I added Swahili. Oh, nice. And that's Swahili because I, it was one of the languages, even during my young pioneer days, that Kwame Nkrumah had recommended that African youth should study. The idea being that we should know more about ourselves on Africa and start developing, getting mm. closer to developing African languages that could unite all of us. So I took my Swahili very seriously. Yeah. And um, I remember my teacher from Zanzibar. And until lately, I was corresponding with him by letter writing his back in Zanzibar. Wow. So. Uh, even now, when I go to East Africa, I, remember, you know, I pick up some of my Swahili, Kiswahili, <laughs> and I, 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 I loved it. Wow. But I ended up the last year with English. English, okay. Uh, you know, right. for my bachelor's. But in school, Legon, who are some of the strong voices that you met, influential guys that you met? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's so difficult to you know, on the spur of the moment. Yeah, I remember the names to like remember that. the yeah. names like that. Mm, um, mm, mm. But your time was Kwesi Butre and the team there? Oh, or they were ahead if of you, you talk about Kwesi Butre, no, Kwesi Butre was ahead of me. Oh, okay. Actually, Kwesi Butre, why Kwesi Butre is interesting is that he came back uh, from the U.S. with a flashy red car, I mean, a sports car, and everybody, Noticed him on the campus. It was a guy that, about yeah, town, right. about town. <laughs> but he, I think he came when I was doing my postgraduate oh, work. Okay. But, uh, to teach yeah, law, then, right? To teach law. Law. Okay. You know, Chachu and others were in the system at the time, at the law school, and they, you know, there was that group of, if I should use the word again, progressive leftist. Uh, lecturers. Were you always tilted towards a leftist orient yeah, orientation? Yeah, because of my Kwame yeah. Nkrumah yeah. upbringing, you know, I could, and it was more liberate, liberational, you know, to, to, to be in the, in the leftist mode and uh, progressive and wanting changes mm. to, 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 to come up. Okay. So, uh, so you don't Kwesi recall Butre. readily some of the names of the people you were with in Legon, who later on had the, the kind of power. Oh, the Ahoys were all in Commonwealth Hall. Kwame Ahoy, Within the same period yeah, where you were? Yeah, Kwame Ahoy was there. Was Kwesi there? No, Atto was already out in the U.S. But Kwesi Ahoy was there. Kwame Ahoy was there. Mm -hmm. um, Atodazi was there. But he was your senior, right? No. Oh, I see. Atodazi well, is also an Adiso Adiso Santa Claus, uh, and he, yeah. he was behind me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And wow. We later had. The but you people defined the new Ghana because all the people you mentioned were actively involved one way or another in the governance of this country for at least some two, two, two and a half decades. That's true. Most people came out of that generation. Yeah. Um, I stood for elections. I was hall president at a point in Commonwealth. And uh, Prof Professor Kofi Kumado, mm -hmm. a whole lot of other they people. Were all Students, at, students the at the time, they were mm -hmm. all my mates, contemporaries. Wow. And campus was active. Very. Very active. With the names you mentioned, man. You know, so, so at the time, did you have this um, chief priest concept? Is it chief priest they call of, it? Of Vandal. Chief Vandal. Yes, yes chief yes, Vandal. Yes, we had, you have we that? had it, we had it. Who I, was your chief Vandal then? Kwame Nahoin. That well, I can say without... Well, that, I, I wanted without, to draw that blinking. from your lips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Yes, yeah. yes, okay, yes. Okay, so yes. you left Legon, and uh, what were the options available when you In left? In fact, my headmaster at Adisada did not give me a breather. Wow. He came before we even did our examinations to request that two or four of us old boys go back to teach at Adisada. Mm -hmm. National Service hadn't come, but he 
thought he needed some old boys to go back to teach. Because again, that was the time most of the white people were, were going, going away. Back, yeah. So, and particularly for English, and then two, two other colleagues of mine for science, he needed some of, you know, in his own words, some of the best students to come back to teach. So, those days, the choices were to go into the civil service or to teach. Um, the corporations, again, um, were not doing very well because after Nkrumah, most of the corporations that had been established were kind of closing down. Mm -hmm. You know, like the State Farm, uh, State Farm's corporation. Uh, we had State Fishing Corporation, yeah. State Fishing Corporation, State Transport Corporation, State Housing Corporation, State Housing Corporation. you know, all that. Yeah, yeah. We even had uh, Mr. Tamis uh, as head of uh, State Farms. State yeah. Farms. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we had all the, and then we had Gehawk, as yeah, you know, correct. I will talk about later because I, I later joined Gehawk. So most of them were closing down. Civil service was open. We needed people in the foreign service, in information service, um, in other services. I had a choice between information service and foreign service. Then I had teaching. Headmaster took me away. So I went to Adesara to teach for two years. I taught English. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the students I taught in Form 1 are now bigger than I am and some have <laughs> better gray hair than mine. Remember some names? Oh, I, I, I probably should save them. Oh, but I, oh students. yeah. Yeah, names were students. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. <laughs> last, uh, last week we had to, we had to do, yeah, bury one of them called Akayensu. Um, he 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 was, you know, in, his, in his own right. Time. Yeah, one of those that. But that was the seven, the seventy-two, seventy-four group, who grew up later, mm -hmm. uh, to to yeah. go into their own fields. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I remember, I'll let you know. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So from from your, the short time you spent teaching. What kind of career path were you looking at from teaching? What then would be your next logical step? Straight. I was going into information. Mm. information was it attractive at the time? Why information? Because of the research, the publications, the writing. And okay. when I went, when I came to Accra, I, I opted for information because, you see, I had been writing. This is the information services department. Information services department. Mm -hmm. And if you want to broaden it, I, it was in line with my communication line. I loved writing, I loved reading, I loved editing. I was editing at Legon, I was there editing everywhere. There in the university, I was a, uh, sorry, even in secondary school, when I, secondary school when I taught, I was the master in charge of the publications. So I've been a publications guy in the so, media. Yeah, yeah. And so, from there, I applied to the information service department. It was not easy. It was not difficult at all because uh, I had a background. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is that I should have stayed maybe much longer to be to to qualify to go for my postgraduate studies. But after one year, I mean, I worked so hard. I I know I worked hard mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that I, was, I they, they left me to. They agreed for me to go on study leave uh, back to the University of Ghana for my graduate studies. Okay. Uh, so this, at this point, which, which course did you do for your postgraduate? Journalism and communication. Oh, wow. At the School of Communication Now you studies. are coming home. <laughs> right. Whoa. Right. Those were the Paul Ansan days. Aha. Uh -huh. I was going to mention. That's right. So Paul Ansan was a, was a teacher then. I'm a lecturer then. Well, oh, he was also yeah, a he was a lecturer before he became the director. Oh, of course, yeah. Yes, yeah. There, there was a white guy who left and then Polansa took over mm. as, the, as the, you know, 
But he he talked to me directly. Yeah. Influenced you in, in, in a way. In in a lot of ways, you know, mm. he was a prolific writer. I mean, seriously, that, that he seriously. Was, he he and Legon Observer at that time had come up, so he encouraged a lot of writing. He was writing, so he encouraged. So although he taught more of PR than journalism, his writing made it seem as if he was the lecturer in journalism. Yeah, yeah. But that was his hobby that affected and influenced most of us. But he was a French scholar too. He was a French scholar. He put the French aside and did a lot more writing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have uh, uh, Dr. Yes. Isi Ansan as young. She was very young. Oh, she uh, was Tell later. her father's story right. on an episode like this. Yes. Because as yes. for Paul Ansan, the name should not die. No, 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 the no. The name should not he, die. He was a phenomenon. Yeah. He, he, he. And I, I, I traveled with him a couple of times. And wow. He, would, he was writing every moment. Although, yeah. you know, his bottle of beer was very regular. But, <laughs> I mean, that was Uncle Paul. Wow. Yeah. Lovely. So you did that, and then um, after? Then after that, instead of going back to information, actually, Dr. Kofi Frimpon at that time was the, the new director of communication or public affairs for SNIT. Oh, so instead of going back to information, which had, you know, sponsored me, he said, no way. You, I want you in SNIT. It was tough. So I said, listen, I got... Um, I got study leave from information. He said, oh, no problem. Brigadier Bokote is my friend. So I will go and talk to him to say that we need you at SNIT. SNIT is also a public service. So this will be in the 70s then, once you mentioned Kote? Yes, this was... Under Kutua Champong then? This was 76. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, 76, 77. Yeah. So he went to see Kote to tell him that this guy is coming out of the School of Journalism. We want him in SNIT. You know, he should have gone back to information services, but... Well, he agreed. Um, the other directors were not very happy. They wish I had come back. But no, as fate will have it, I came back later as Deputy Minister of Information. But... Um, I went to SNIT. Yeah, at the time you used to call it social security, Social right? security. No, we, we had the bank and we had the SNIT. Yes, SNIT, yes. Yes, yeah. but social security. Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. that was the most prestigious public organization I'm you could join you to. Uh, you mm -hmm. could join at the time and, you know, mm. riding in, um, in Setra buses. But of course, I went in as a manager, gave me a car. They gave me, you know, housing, and it was something to stay on. But even then, uh, public relations, I was using my time to do a lot of broadcasting. Okay. <sighs> At some point, you found yourself in, in um, I don't know whether it's you, because I, I, I was at a function, a conference in, in, in Nairobi, some years back, and somebody had mentioned that Mr. Mr. Yanka used to teach in their school in Nairobi. Right. I don't know whether it's you or any of your brothers. No, it's me. I went to, there was a special course okay. at the University of Nairobi mm -hmm. that I was invited to attend. That course should have taken place at the Institute of Social Studies in, uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands. Okay. So they brought the course to. Okay, so you were there for a period. I was there for a period. Yeah, because he mentioned and That's I, I, true. I, I was a bit lost. That's so. true. <laughs> okay. So I was so. in the University of Nairobi. Wow. Your, your Swahili came it in handy? It I, I, you know, within a few weeks, I was speaking Swahili. You will? Yes. <laughs> you Once know? you are immersed in the system, yes, yes, it makes yes, it easier. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I used to be a regular visitor to, to, to Nairobi. Oh, yeah, really? So this back and forth thing oh, happened. Okay. Yeah. You know, I loved, I loved Kenya. I, know, I wow. love Nairobi. Okay. So, again, at some point, you were involved with 
Daily Graphic. That was much later. Much later. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so let me not jump. Mm. So this is Footprint with Mr. Kujoyanka. We'll be right back. This is Fact Finder from the BBC. We live in a world where news travels fast. And sometimes, it's hard to differentiate fact from fiction. Fact Finder brings fact-checking from the newsroom up close so you can separate truth from chaff. Be empowered to tell what's fake from what's real. Watch Fact Finder by the BBC on City TV every Wednesday at 6 p.m. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back. This is Footprint, and on this episode, we are with Mr. Kojoyanka, and he's taking us through his own uh, footprints, and it's been wonderful so far. Um, so, we, we, I, I, like I said before the break about Kutua Champo, your own views about his six years. I think he started very well. He was a very quote and unquote selfless soldier. I think he had a bit of the sense of the incrementalism in him. It was he, obvious. He wanted to bring back that spirit of incrementalism and some of the highlights of Nkrumah's policies. Though he clothed them in certain words, it was clear <laughs> that he, he really wanted a revival of it. It went well, of course. See, one thing about Achampo, he knew his shortcomings. So he also invited very eminent you know, people around him, economists. Um, Dr. Abe. Dr. Abe. Dr. Mm Abe. -hmm. Uh, Omabo. Um, he had. Um, That's Ian Omabo. Ian Omabo. The ex, the former right. Uh, chief. Right. And then he appointed for a civil service experience, civil servants, as ambassadors. He he, he had he had that kind of. Uh, and then he brought back Operation Feed Yourself, a very good idea, I think because he, he thought, and I, there's no reason not to believe him, that we can feed ourselves mm. if we, we, are, we all get involved. So civil servants grow something in your backyard. Um, there were loans for people who wanted to go and do farming, encouragement to those who wanted to go and support um, the rural areas. And then one interesting thing he also did, go back to your villages to participate in festivals, the cultural thing. And looking back, he wanted educated people in their cities not to forget their roots. Mm. So That's destructive, very. Very, very. So, you, yeah, we, we felt proud going back to join in a Kwambo festival or mm. Fetu festival. Because it, it made a lot of sense because then the family reunion was there and then you caught the cultural foundations of, of where you come from. And so we respected tradition. Mm -hmm. That was the indirect way of sending us back to our roots and so on and so forth. Okay. Along the line... As happens to all men. You know? <laughs> or most men. Most men. You know, <laughs> there were departures from the original thinking. And so favoritism started coming in and, you know, it, 
it had to come to people that you know and of course it it sounded like rumors but it wasn't a rumor that people had it easy to get business favors I later worked in Gehawk, as I said before. Um, but Gehawk, the, the Gehawk, holding company. The holding or, company. Yeah. The holding company, the headquarters. Uh, where was this? The headquarters at the opposite National Theatre. Children's Park. That's Children's like, Park, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that was a period where somebody, you could hold a cheat, right? <laughs> Just a cheat. You didn't have money. But you could come to Gihok for 50 cartons of because sugar. Because somebody's signature was on it. Somebody's signature was. And what you are going to do, you are going to sell it to a market woman yeah. who had the money. You didn't have the money. Yeah. So once you turn it over, you make a profit. Yeah. You know, so that became very common. And, and it's not that people said it. I worked in Gihok, so I know what I'm talking about. So this is the mid to late 70s there about yes so mm -hmm. this was 78 okay so then that this is um with uh, when mr williams i was also there william so was my boss as a head of public public relations yeah, and i was yeah. his deputy okay so, so mr williams also used to host talking point at that some is point. true that is true. very interesting. I still have a picture of Mr. William Sir yes. seated on GBC Black and White TV. True. <laughs> William Sir was, and again, that was part of my, I was already doing radio. Okay. I was producing a program called African Scene. Mm -hmm. On GBC. And GBC. Yeah. And GBC had external service. Mm -hmm. So I was producer, presenter, the host. Wow. I was doing it with Alote Papo, J. Alote Papo, who mm -hmm. passed. Yeah. So I was on the radio side. William Sir was hosting TV. Talking, you know, talking Point. And there was another program called Periscope. Periscope. I remember so Periscope. So yeah. I was moved to go and host Periscope. And then people in GBC were like, it was like a fight. Oh, we want him on TV. We want him on radio, that kind of thing. So yeah. I ended up taking over William Sa when William Sa handed over he virtually handed over to me so how how many years were you editor of daily graphic I was two years two into the second to uh, the to a third year and then the Amata Queen story came up yeah and yeah. Uh, I was suspended <laughs> for putting the Amata Queen interview on the front page of the graphic who who and um, so this is this is the time they this, used to call it People's Daily Graphic. Yes. <laughs> Not that they call it. I I gave it the name. So so well, I did. I wanted to be diplomatic. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the idea. So you gave it the name People's Daily Graphic because you believed in the course at the time. I did. The uh, socialist course. Yes, and also, you see, there's something about journalism that mm -hmm. uh, we were losing. Okay. When we talk, well, I'm, I'm a more development communication person. Everything shows about that. And so my idea was, let's also cover the people. It, so it was always a front page, the big people. The, so the people who produced the wealth of the country, did they have their stories on the front page? I tell you, it was, it was a passion of mine. There were two major incidents, and I say two major. One would be the murder of the High Court judges, or the judges, and of course, Major Samakwa, unfortunately. And also, the deportation of Ghanaians from Nigeria. You know, how, so what was your own version of these two stories, and how you covered it? Right. I remember vividly. Uh, when Nigeria decided to deport about 1.2 million Ghanaians. And first, as a newspaper, how we were going to handle it, the stories. And Ghana's preparedness to receive 1.2 million um, Ghanaians. All within a short space of time. 
I must say that our what do you call the organization? The organization that's um, the one uh, Steve Obimpelet. Yes. Yeah, at yeah, one yeah, point. yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. this was set up at one point. It was also mobilization. Led, mobilization. Yes. Yes. It was also led by E.T. Mesa. E.T. Mesa at some know, point. At some yeah. point, and then. Um, one person who became chairman of NDC at some point. Um, yeah, they really went on the ground to prepare grounds for reception of Ghanaians, and it was not easy. But something happened. A lot of foreign journalists flew into Ghana, mm -hmm. and all the supports in terms of assistance that we're getting from international organizations, we're in the form of tents, mats, you know, items, where some were medical and so on and so forth. Then they come to Ghana, although a base was set up at the International Trade Fair Center. What are the Ghanaians? As in Ghanaian journalists? No. Or the Ghanaians coming? Ghanaians coming. See, that was one beautiful thing about Ghanaians that we have not given attention to. They worked in such a way, they had this organization had vehicles ready. People were registered at the trade fair site, and then they found out people who came from a similar community. And if there were 20 people from Swedro, this is a bus for you, go to Swedro go to Kumasi. And people didn't want to live in the tents. All the tents that were brought down from neighboring, from international organizations, virtually they became useless. So Ghanaians came in, the next day they, they slept, they got registered, and then this, is it Nadmo? Yeah, Na Nadmo. Nadmo found vehicle they had mobilized a number of trucks and buses that took people straight to their villages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is something that we have underplayed, but it shows the kind of net, uh, connectedness we are to our families. Everybody had a family. Yeah. So though your people, and then they chased them up there, not more chased them there, to help them with settling down. Settling. Mm -hmm. Instead of keeping them in tents and camps at yeah. the trade fair site. Oh, okay. And uh, as a newspaper, we were more interested in not just here, there. And um, as one of our reporters, again, may he rest in peace, uh, Breda Atakwesin. Breda was on leave, but a good sense. He was in Nigeria, just visiting friends. Good sense told him. Let me go to the harbor where Ghanaians are being shipped mm -hmm. to Ghana. He took excellent pictures. We put his pictures on the front page and international media subscribed to it. In fact, I think we, we rained in a lot of dollars for that picture. And later I made him, I gave him a special award because here was a journalist who was on vacation, but it happened, he went there First, he didn't only hold his own camera, but he he pulled a, you know a professional cameraman, took him along, and they took perfect pictures. And he did a story from Nigeria mm. to Ghana. So graphic, we did two two editions a day during that period mm. because it was selling like you know hot cake. So that is how we covered it from the professional. Is that a picture of? The ship where people were hanging. Oh yeah, that's a picture. Yes, oh. it went viral, and news agencies around the world were calling Graphic to buy to buy that picture. Wow, you know it came from a mm. journalist, and I always mention it that journalists. Uh, should his name is Breda. Breda Aqua, uh, Atakwesin. Atakwesin. He Obviously also passed. One of your, your no, second year yeah, from <laughs> from second year. Okay, so I'll take a quick break and um, come back and then we can talk about um, the other big story that I, I, I refer to, which is um, 
just not, not not to put you on the spot but to see how daily graphic at the time reported it and how it ended up on the front page which ultimately led to your departure if i should say so this is still footprint with mr kujoyanka we'll be right back this is fact finder from the bbc we live in a world where news travels fast and sometimes it's hard to differentiate fact from fiction fact finder brings fact checking from the newsroom up close so you can separate truth from chaff. Be empowered to tell what's fake from what's real. Watch Fact Finder by the BBC on City TV every Wednesday at 6 pm. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back. Uh, this is Footprint. My name is Samuel Atamensa. If you just joined us, we are having a conversation with Mr. Kojo Yanka, a man of many parts and so much to learn from this man. His humility. Look, the guy just turned 77. He will pass for a 50-year-old, trust me. <laughs> Very coherent, consistent, and remembers every detail. And so we are, we are very blessed to be here. So, as editor of Daily Graphic, or the People's Daily Graphic at the time, um, you covered the Ghana deportation of Ghanaians from Nigeria, um, which some say is a retaliation, you know, what we did to them in the um, Buzia time, or, you know, pushing the Nigerians away. And, you know, by now, many years after, we should know that Ghanaians and Nigerians, we are just inseparable. <laughs> We're just inseparable, so it should leave us to be. Anyway, so the other story will be the, the murder of the High Court judges and Major Sam Akwa. How, how did you capture it as a newspaper at the time? Well, we, we covered the... The, the SIB investigations. Okay. Uh, there were two types of investigation, and we covered them as uh, they sat, and then all the reports coming out, and we followed some of the white paper. Government issued a white paper on the last SIB report, particularly the one that mentioned. Remember the makeup of the SIB. The people who were... Uh, I've forgotten the names of uh, the, the justices, um, but okay. no, I don't, I don't remember okay. readily, right. yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But I remember that the Attorney General was Akins, and he had to do a white paper on the, on the last report and determined that major... All, all the time, you know, the attention was being pushed on Captain Chikata, that he, oh, yeah, he was the brain behind yeah, it. Yeah. And so um, when the white paper came, it was not one of those to be... Um, it wasn't even referenced in the thing, right? Yeah, it was not one of those to be put before before court. Okay. So, um, so America, uh, so Amate 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 Kwe, Kwe, America, you had uh, in Srowo. In Srowo, I think uh, there was a Tassiru. Tassiru, yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, that were put before courts, and we covered the whole story. Mm. And uh, I remember the portion where it looked very much like, oh, the brain behind it mm -hmm. was Captain Chikata. But because he had been taken out, it was not before the court. When the, the final report came, and they said that Amatekwe Amate yeah. was the leader and so on, um, we, we, again, we reported as the report came up. And then came the time of his execution. Something happened. And one week, it was a weekend, I think, 
all editors were invited to the information services department mm -hmm. well, for at the time there were no private papers like that just a few just a few yeah one or but two mainly papers, yeah. the public newspapers and yeah. I, th I think there were one or two correspondents um, of foreign, the, for B foreign BBC, yeah. BBC and some other and what was it um, Miss uh, Ayi was the Minister for Information. Mm -hmm. Secretary at the time. Secretary of yeah, Information, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we went, and here comes in uh, Jerry Rawlings, and um, he tells a certain story that was meant for us to laugh, but yeah, we, we didn't laugh because. We, it, it was the like mood. the mood, the mood was why we've been called on a, on is a, it a Saturday like evening or Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon too. So he was going to play back the last confession Amate of Amate Kwe. So we listened. The, and the highlight of it was that. Um, don't blame Captain Chikata. Captain Chikata should forgive me. He was not responsible for so and so and so and so forth. In other words, saying that he was responsible for everything and that the state should look after his children. You know, a very emotional thing. And that was it. And then it ended. Then, um, so for us, it was a big story mm -hmm. because here the whole story had been lined up to make Captain Chikata the brain Close. behind it. But and yeah, here yeah. he's saying, no, Captain Chikata should forgive him, you know, that kind of thing. So we used the story. Um, and what was the angle you used? You remember? I remember, see, I remember the headline, don't... Uh, don't blame Captain Chikata. Don't blame Captain Chikata. Something like that. It's in my, it's in my book, uh, Motherland. <laughs> um, so we used it. Front page story. By 10 o'clock, the newspaper was finished. We had to go into a second edition. Because it was big. But then, um, early in the afternoon, I get a visitor. Joyce Sai comes to say, I have some bad news for you. Your story was not well received at the at the castle, and I have a letter for you to go on indefinite suspension. And I asked, what's the problem? He said the story was in bad taste and all that. I opened the letter, read it, and I called an editorial meeting, showed it to everybody. Everybody was shocked. My deputy, Sam Clerk, he, he was the most shocked I saw from his face that, no, but said, well, that time, Josiah, the revolution. <laughs> Josiah was gone. So uh, I packed my and that was and baggage. It. That was it. I went home. I left even my car behind. You know, I left the official car and then went home. I took it easy. Where were you staying at the time? At, his, at uh, my wife thought was teaching at Wesley, uh, Grammar, Wesley Grammar School. So I went <laughs> back there. My kids were in school. So by the time they got back from holidays, I was home. <laughs> Interestingly, I used to come to your house then. Oh, yeah? <laughs> to see Bernard. To, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. You know. Yes, yes, those days. Bernard Ankuma. Yes, that's right. Yes. Oh, my goodness. You know, well, I didn't know this. But well, now you reveal a whole lot of things. Anyway, but, uh, so, so then you moved on. But again, you, you, you metamorphosed into uh, information minister. Yes. So I, I was home for several months. Until one day I got a call that I should report to the castle, Captain Chikata. And the information was that I had to go to 
the Ghana Institute of Journalism as director. <laughs> which means that graphic was out. I had been offered two places to go to join um, West Africa magazine in London or to go on posting to Latin America mm -hmm. in one of the embassies and I had turned both of them down. Mm -hmm. So this time I said, you are going to GIG as director. And I said, wait a minute, where is my friend? <laughs> who was then? Who was then? Cabral, Blay, I'm here. <laughs> so I said, but Cabral is a... He said, no, Cabral is in Europe on a course. And when he comes back, he, we have a, another place for him. I told Captain, listen, this is not... It doesn't sound... Not that I don't like the, the place, no, but we are too close. We are friends. So can this be written down? Because... Um, when I was being moved from graphic, I was not even given any letter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you don't want a repetition. I yeah. don't want a repetition. So he made sure a letter was written for me that I had been appointed editor of the graphic. And again, as I'm saying, I knew everybody. I was a columnist, mm -hmm. so at least they knew me. I had I was on TV almost yeah. every now and then, yeah. so I wasn't a new face in the media. And when I went, all the deputy editors were people I knew. So I had a good camaraderie. And, um, but uh, so I, I moved to, now I moved to GIJ. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, Cabra came much later, but I took over from him. And I was there for how many years? Until for. This was 84, 92. When the elections were coming, they lifted the ban. My constituency people chased me here for me to go and be MP. I That's had Aguna the, East, right? Aguna East. Yeah. I had never thought of politics. Never. <laughs> never. You, you, don't worry. You still don't look like one. <laughs> <laughs> so all the cheese and people and, you know, and so I said, okay, I'll submit myself for it, but for it for a term. Yeah. You know, I, I told myself I maximum two terms, you know. So I went in, of course I won the election. I didn't have to do much. So much, yeah. The you time, know, yeah. I won sixty six percent of the of the votes, became MP. So I went into Parliament ninety three in March. The president nominated me as Deputy Minister for Information mm -hmm. to Mr. Totobi Kwachi. Mm -hmm. As there until ninety six. I was made a full minister, central region minister, and moved out of Accra to central region. Mm, <laughs> Cape the, Coast. Cape Coast. <laughs> I was there for two years. Well, I know, I labeled Cape Coast the uh, central region, the uh, tourism hub. Tourism heartbeat of Ghana's yeah. tourism. And, and, and tell branded. me, this is the same period you started Panafest, is that? Yes, Panafest has started, but it gained more ground. Because I, I yes. anytime I think of, of Panafest, uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't know yeah, why. You yeah, are not the only one. You are the person that's that true. comes to mind. So, and you were in charge for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, I was chairman for 10 years, you know. But even when I moved out of Cape Coast mm -hmm. to Kumasi, I was still chairman of Panafest. So, so let me take my time. You were first Deputy Minister for Information mm -hmm. with um, KTQ uh, Kofito Tobikwachi as your boss at mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. up until two, uh, 1996. End of 96. And then 97. NDC won again. So 97, you were moved, or you are still uh, there? No, I was moved. Okay, to the central region? The central region as okay. a full minister. As a full minister. Okay, I mean, the fancy man comes back to central region, you know. Uh, it's, uh, but who did you succeed? Um, Ato Airebi Aqua. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Airebi Aqua. Yeah, Dr. Airebi Aqua. I yes. remember him. Dark. I remember him. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, I think after him, no, let, let me correct it. It was Achiano. Uh, values Achano took over from Ayebiaka. Oh, okay. And then Ayebiaka took over from Kobina Fusu. 
Yeah, Cobden Fosu. Yeah, that so line. So Achano, Achano, Achano was, fire service was guy. connected with fire service at the time. It was the head of fire service at the time. He and then yeah. he was Miss Central Nigeria Minister, mm -hmm. and then later when I took over from him, he went to Czechoslovakia as the ambassador. Oh, nice, nice. Now, you never intended to go into politics, you know, leaving your life small, small, doing your PR, journalism, education, and all that. You find yourself there, and. Um, most of the roles and the functions you played um, were handled in the most honorable fashion. Um, and I'm, I'm talking as somebody who covered a lot in the media from that time. Um, but from Central Region, you ended up in Ashanti Region as Minister. And was this the time that they pushed Alabi to Northern Region and, you know, different people for, you know, what, what was the whole point i still do not understand but i <laughs> suspect that <laughs> i was the main um, reason maybe to get me out of central, central. and take me to some difficult but place your like Shanti Shanti. region was a blessing <laughs> <laughs> So that in my in my own memory, mm -hmm. you would be the the second Fanti man to have been substantive Ashanti regional minister, um, only next to Kenel Bedu. Remember Kenel Bedu? True. Um, under Kutua Champon. True. Yeah. Because he also came from Central, Central Region, region. Yeah. straight to you know. Uh, Shanti. So, so how is your experience like? Fanti man comes to, everything is different in Kumasi. You see, if you ask me, that's what we should do in Ghana. We should send people who do not come from certain areas to parts of the country where they will experience a new culture, they will feel, and then they will put up their best. We, we've been having this chat with Mr. Kojoyanka. There's so much. We can do another two episodes. And still, he will still have a lot more to, to say. I'll tell you something. There's so much in this book. <laughs> now, I didn't come here to promote a book. I came here to promote the passion that he has, which is captured in this book, Our Motherland, My Life. And this is a book about him and his experiences, his engagement with the Ghana society growing up, his career, and his legacy. This is it. You captured it well, right? Good. So, our motherland, my life. Go to the University of Ghana bookshop and say that I said you should come and buy it. <laughs> I'm you. telling you, when you buy it and you read it, when you meet me at an outdooring or a funeral or a party, you will thank me. But please buy it. It will make a lot of sense and put a lot of the stories in the proper context. Our Motherland, My Life by Kojo Yanka. So this is where we end our story um, for this edition of Footprints. Mr. Yanka, thank you so much for thank giving you. us your time. Thank you, sir. And I am sure that this book will have to do a reprint because people need to read the story. And he has accounts of some of the things that he just cracked the surface. I'm telling you, if you read this one, Dali, you will thank me. Anyway, <laughs> thanks already for joining us. It's been another wonderful edition of Footprints. My name is Samuel Atamensa. See you next week. <laughs>